Okay, welcome back to Bible study, and we are looking at the Bible readings for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany, which is Deuteronomy chapter 30, 15 through 20, Psalm 119, 1 through 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 9, and Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 37. And I think a lot of what we are hearing today through those most all those scripture readings kind of refers to um, God's law, God's decree, the commandments. So that's kind of what we'll be um, exploring a lot because of the readings today. So let's go ahead and uh, begin with our prayer. God, the strength of all who hope in you, because we are mortals, we accomplish nothing good without you. Help us to see and understand the things we ought to do and give us the grace and power to do them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, so again, to start out, we're in Deuteronomy, and that's chapter 30, Deuteronomy. So one of the... Of the, just open up to that page. It just went right there. Isn't that amazing how that happens once in a while? I, I, I have my little helper because I have my little tabby thing. So, yeah. <laughs> so I try to set that up in advance so it goes well. So, All right. So um, I think you all may have heard this, but I'll just kind of repeat a little bit for the, for the Bible study. So the book of Deuteronomy is... Um, one of the Torah, first five books of the Bible, and it's the last of those five. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And uh, the arc of the story, well, of course, you could say it all does start with Genesis. It does, of course. But really, in a way, Exodus through Deuteronomy is kind of one massive story because it's starting with the, they became slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. And then God helps, uh, gives them Moses to, to help be their deliverer. And then Moses uh, helps them escape from Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, get out of here, go. I don't want you here anymore. And then they're over, and then they get the Ten Commandments. And then they journey, after the Ten Commandments, they actually get to the Promised Land without um, um, months, in a matter of months. It isn't a massively long time. However... They get there, and the people are afraid. They're afraid of the inhabitants of the land that they're supposed to enter and to possess that is God, the promised land. And so then um, God says, well, in that case, you're not ready. And I always like to say, take another lap. That's, that was what God told them, take another lap. Well, uh, that extra lap was 40 years. <laughs> that's a long, long time. And even though that's a vast desert, I always do marvel a little bit. They were meandering in that space for, for 40, 40 years. Um, God was very much taking care of them. That was, you know, they were always could rely on God. God provided them food, the bread, the, the birds for the, for the protein, the, the water. So, you know, God watched over them all that time. And so after 40 years, they're back to the edge of the promised land. And, um, and so that's basically, that's what took up Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers to get them back to the edge of the Promised Land. And then Deuteronomy is, they're there, they're just about ready to go there, only um, unfortunately, Moses can't go in. And so this is Moses' big goodbye speech. That's what... All of the uh, book of Deuteronomy is about it's it's Moses big goodbye farewell parting words and I do smile a little bit because 33 chapters of Deuteronomy that's a lot he has a lot to share um, and we're near the end of that big big message and that's where then Moses says this is pivotal you have a choice to make you know, you are now going into the land that God promised to your forefathers. And God is keeping this promise. So this is, um, this is the moment, you know, pivotal moment. So let's, um, let's go ahead and pick up in 
in Deuteronomy in um, chapter 30. And let's do verse, um, you know, it's not super long, but we'll just, we'll just kind of start with, um, I think we'll break it up a little bit though. So as we talk about it, we'll just focus in a little. So if, um, if we can do to start, we'll do, um, Deuteronomy 30, just verse 15 and 16. John, if you want to maybe start us off. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to, uh, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and that Lord your God will bless you in the land uh, which you go to possess. All right, thank you. So that's that's the proposition. That's the, this is your choice. This is your moment. You know, this is your big decision. Mm -hmm. And um, I always, and then later on, it'll, it'll also kind of repeat it just a little bit too. But I, I always feel like in some ways when you hear that, if you just say, I'd like to say if someone walks up to you on the street and says, okay, here's your choice. Do you choose life or do you choose death? It's like, uh, who's not going to say I choose life? I don't know. I mean, well, maybe a person who's despondent in life, I'd hate to think. But anyway, basically it's an obvious seems like a super obvious choice. Um, but it also is proposing, you know, to keep God's ways, keep God's commandments, keep God's decrees and ordinances. It uses a whole bunch of different words for the what we might call commandment. Or the other word we hear is law. That's the other word. Um, and Torah is the Hebrew word that is often translated as law, but also as teaching, teaching. And I, I think, I wish they had that in there, that word teaching in there a little more, because I feel like that is more like guidance and, and you think you're getting taught things that are, that are good, whereas sometimes the laws found, feel maybe like you must do, you know, like a, like a very stern or being ordered. And the other one is more like a teacher who's, you know, giving you information and who's giving you guidance and... And so I, I get a little different feel between the word law and the word teaching, um, but the, it could be in both things. Um, so when you think, and I, I think to keep it simple here, uh, there's well over, I think easily over 600 and some laws that are in the Old Testament. But for our purpose, just to kind of simplify, we'll just kind of think about the Ten Commandments because that's one that is at least still familiar to most everybody. You know, so just to kind of keep it, keep it simple. Um, so let's just, just kind of keep on that. So what is good? What would you say is good about the Ten Commandments? What would you call good about them? It's guidance. Definitely guidance. Yep. yep. Well, I can say a little bit more than guidance. A little just more, a little more, a little more than just our guidance, okay. And I, I think a lot of the, these 600 and some odd law, laws yeah. were were probably appropriate for a bunch of people who were going in all different directions back mm -hmm. at that time. They had no other than a mob mm -hmm. moving from place to place. There had to be some sort of right. When they left Egypt, they had to have something that helped shape yeah, who they were and some... how they would have structure and how they would exist yeah. together. Because before they'd all been under a dictator, a pharaoh, but a dictator, right? They didn't have control, their own control. So they needed extra help. I would say that's they were not, a good point. They to build a nation. To, yeah, to become because a people, become something. a nation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so think of it as in terms of helping shape their identity as a people, as a nation, as God's, as God's people, but still also even as a nation too. And, and there, the, um, yeah, there were actually a lot of people that probably left Egypt. And they might not all have originally known God, as in not maybe all were just actual descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They might not all have actually been direct descendants. So there might have been others who came. So they needed to learn more. They needed to know more. And even so, later yeah. on, as they went and 
you know, even when he got into the promised land, they started moving away to various gods and idols. Yeah, well, that was the temptation. So, yeah. So mm -hmm. they, they didn't even they didn't even start off. They kind of came together. Yeah. And kind of, yeah. I like to think of it too. Um, I like to make an analogy between, um, you know, as far as a very pivotal choice in life, uh, getting married, right? And so uh, to make that choice, to make that commitment, like, you know, God is proposing in a sense, I want you to make this choice, this good choice, um, but it's going to change the direction of your life. And so uh, a pivotal moment is the actual ceremony and the wedding and getting married. That's like a pivotal moment and saying, I am committing to this person, to this choice. But then life continues and you need to be living in that choice day by day by day. And that's where the, the word, you know, first God sets the choice, but he also, he is saying, um, so I am, the, to, if you obey the commandments, I, the Lord, I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, observing his commandments. And so while it goes from a pivotal choice a kind of single moment almost, but yet it, it's something that that moment's choice affects everything that comes next. And I like, I really appreciate, one of the things hearing is, it starts out with lifting up loving the Lord your God. So it's, it's, it's foundation is in a relationship that God loves us and we want to return that love. That that's why we want to keep God's way. It's, it's out of a sense of knowing that we have been loved and forgiven, that we want to respond to what God is showing us, the way that God is showing us. And then walking is, um, again, that's more the day by day by day by day kind of, and um, observing um, all of those things. I will say this, even though I don't usually really want to try to go and read all 600 and some laws. <laughs> I appreciate an element about that in that I think, kind of like what you were saying, it was helping them live in a connection with God all the time. Because it was, it was things that touched on all kinds of parts of your daily life, the food you're going to eat, um, the ways you're going to worship, the, you know, maybe not every little bitty aspect of life, but it kind of made it that, you know, God's woven within all of your day-to-day -day parts of your life. And I, I think of that, um, that gives me more appreciation of things like, say, the food guidance. Whereas I, and sometimes I think, oh, how oppressive that must be, having to remember what food you can eat and what food you can't eat. And, and now I kind of got to say, well, okay, no way. Maybe that's, the good of it is, Every time you're going to have prepare a meal, you're thinking about this is part of your relationship with God. And we could do that, right? And saying grace for our food is a nice way we try to remember and acknowledge that, you know, the, the food that we're sharing is a gift from God and, and we're thankful to God. Um, so, so I think there's ways we do acknowledge that, but I like... I like that aspect, but I still don't want to keep all the food laws. That doesn't mean I want to talk to Again, I think when it yeah. first started out, we yeah. had a mob of uh -huh. people who were city dwellers or, or whatever, and they weren't nomads, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're going to be nomads, so they don't know. They don't know the, the desert. desert. They don't know what it's so like out there. So the health and food mm -hmm. laws were, uh, were... Help them know what's safer, what's not safe. safe. And, yeah. And, and yeah. So it made, it a, helps. made a whole it helps. lot of sense yeah. in my view. There's a part of that. There, there seems to be definitely an element that could help it be safer, safer choices on food. Not maybe only, but there's an element definitely that gave some guidance towards foods that would be and safer. With themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so you get married and you're ongoing, you're walking, um, but then going into this new land and there are people already there, and so they're going to face temptation, and so this is what the next part does point to. Um, there will be temptation in this new land. So um, verse 17 and 18. Um, could you read that next, Johnny? It does it start? But if, it, if, but if your heart, heart yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, or are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, 
I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so here's the danger. And this is also why I think it was important that Moses was saying, you, you should make your choice before you get there. <laughs> Be aware, because there's a danger there. And that was there were all kinds of people who already had their own gods, and once they moved in and they were surrounded by some of these other people, because even though there were battles, and the book of Joshua does talk about certain battles, and they did have to fight sometimes into their way into the promised land, um, there's also evidence that they sometimes just moved in. You know, like they, they didn't actually eradicate everyone who already lived there. That did not, you know, there were battles, but not everybody was, you know, they didn't destroy all the people there. So they, were, they had new neighbors, and these neighbors had different gods and different ways. And so now that they set up agriculture, and they set up raising their own flocks, and those other people who are already there would say, well, now if you want your, your, uh, you know, your wheat to really grow well, you better pray to this god. Or you know, if you want your, your lambs to have lots of lambs in your flock, you better pray to this god. And so there would be a pull to say, oh, well, that's what works here. That's what I should do. You know, I should go along with the uh, common, common way, the way that everybody here does this, right? And so, um, but that's not that's not really bringing life. And you know, idols nowadays are not literal carvings of you know, bring your offering. Well, okay, in some places are, but but mostly for in us, it's it's whatever tempts us away from putting God first putting something else first in life instead of God. And that's, you know, so we can still have temptations, even though it's not exactly the same way they were facing, but, you know, we can still face, we can still have those temptations. Um, I don't know, what, what do you think might, in, these, in our day, what are the temptation of things, what are things that people might put first instead of God? What might be something? Pleasure, entertainment. Okay, pleasure and entertainment, yeah. Gambling, maybe. Maybe it might be gambling, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people can, um, it can become an addiction. It can become what rules, you know, rules your life. Yeah. Money. Stuff. Most stuff, money. just wanting stuff. Want more stuff. More stuff. <laughs> I want to have more stuff than that person has <laughs> stuff, yeah. So seeking more possessions and more and more, yeah, yeah. Um, power right mm -hmm. some people make power their god to have more power than any you know above others as much as they possibly can so there's yeah there's money you know i mean there's all kinds of things that can start taking over first place so again we're not we're not immune to it because we live in a modern era we have other way, other ways that things tempt us away from god but what really gives life sustains life is only really what is God is the source of that and so God and that's what God wants God wants us to choose life God wants us to have a blessed life and um, and part of this is not just all relationship with God but a lot of the Ten Commandments when you think about it have to do with us and one another and we'll uh, we'll touch on that some more when we get to the reading from Matthew so we'll we'll save that till Till then, um, let's touch on the Psalm 119, um, and if you can turn to this, uh, this is just because I wanted to kind of point something out to you about that Psalm more than uh, what we had in the just in the little bulletin, kind of the little printed bulletin. Um, so Psalm 119, you know, I always like to say to find the Psalms is you kind of if you just kind of go right in the middle of your Bible, roughly right in the middle. Almost always you end up inside the Psalms. 
And um, there are 150 psalms, so obviously Psalm 119 is more towards the latter latter part of the book of Psalms. Or... So um, Psalm 119, we, we were in church, we were reading verses 1 through 8. Um, Barb, do you want to read verse Psalm 119, verse 1 through 8? Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your least your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. All right, thank you. So so that's verses one through eight. And um, if you've if you found that psalm in your Bible, you may notice that it continues. And it continues <laughs> and it continues. <laughs> And it continues, and it continues. This is multiple pages in, in my Bible. I'm still flipping pages here. Uh, yeah, several pages long, and then it's 176 uh, verses. And um, it has something to do, I forget how many verses per, but like well, how... It's the first letter of all yeah, the Hebrew. So, so the first letter of the Hebrew in the Hebrew alphabet for every letter, a, it begins second. with the letter Aleph or A, we'll just say A, yeah. Aleph, and then it goes on for a while, having begun with that letter, and then it goes to the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and then has a certain number of verses, and then another verse, number number of verses, and another, so, so it goes all the way through the, all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and then it has multiple verses per each letter, which is how you end up getting such a large, large number of verses. So, so yeah, it's it's kind of kind of a neat thing. I think. Let me think of it. If this makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I think yes. It's um, eight. It is eight verses per letter. That's because there's twenty two, twenty two letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So that means yeah, it's eight, actually eight verses per letter. That's that's a lot. That was very, kudos to the, <laughs> we'll say, it's, it's attributed to King David. So that was, that was quite a feat there. Um, but basically, it goes on and on as saying, God, I love your law. Your love is awesome. Your love is great. There's nothing better than your law, God. And um, I have to confess that my own life experience, I've never had that motivation to feel like, wow, God, even about the Ten Commandments, which I think are very, 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 very good and very, very, very important, I don't know if I've ever gone like exuberant, like, oh God, I love your Ten Commandments. They're just so wonderful. They're the best ever. Um, so I, part of me feels I appreciate that someone could be so happy about the gift of God's law that they have to celebrate it for 176 verses, you know. <laughs> Um, it's a good reminder to me that, you know, it is a great blessing. Um, so because, and here's the Lutheran thing about looking at God's law is one aspect of God's law is that it points out where we have failed. You know, it is telling us the truth when we have failed. And uh, so there it is acting like a judge. And so sometimes God's law is... It is a judge, it is. Um, but then it is in, in so that I don't get the wrong idea and think that I can somehow prove myself righteous to God, that I can somehow earn my own righteous standing before God or my own salvation. That that's one element of the law shows me I can't. I cannot. I cannot bridge the gap between me and God. I cannot. However, God crosses that with Jesus comes to us. And then because of Jesus' death and resurrection, then now, now Jesus opens back that, that way that we can be 
look, look as though we are righteous in God's sight because we are justified through Jesus Christ. Not our own doing, not our own works, but through Jesus Christ. So, um, but the law has so much that is good and that God's all intention is, it is meant to be blessing. And it is to bring life in connection with one another. And um, one of the things I always, I always like to do, and it is a good reminder to myself too, is you know where the where the law is good is that it creates the space for community it creates the sometimes i think of it as a fence or as a boundary and that that keeps us um, safe together as humans um, so like i like to take kids out to the corner or intersection of pebble and pecos here where the church is and stand on the corner for a little bit and watch the traffic go by and then, and then say, well, now, what do you think would happen if there were no stoplights? What do you think would happen if there were no speed limit signs? What do you think would happen if there were no curbs for the sidewalk where we're standing and, and the cars could just, you know, turn sharply? You know, there'd be a lot of danger. There'd be a lot of accidents. There could even be life lost. And so, you know, God's intention of giving the law is, is to protect life, is to enhance life. It's to keep, keep life in a good space. And so that's, that's where I can also be reminded how the law is good, and it is a true gift. And it is, in its, in its way, it's a blessing. It keeps us in a better relationship as humans here on earth, but it doesn't get us to heaven. That's kind of the distinction, I think, at least in my way of, of looking at it. So, um, so this goes on and on, and um, so a little one little tidbit in here that it, I was reminded on verse two, it says, um, "Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart." And I have to be reminded of this again and again and again. And that is that in the Hebrew, the word for heart or the concept of what the heart meant is different when we hear it. We're actually here on Valentine's Day. Today is, you know, we happen to be gathered on Valentine's Day. And when we hear heart, we think, oh, love, or we think our emotions. We think of something very much about our related to our emotions, right? And love and such. Um, but in the Old Testament time, the heart, uh, interestingly, was a little bit more like what we might put in the brain. It was more like making decisions. It was more like your determination, your will, like your heart meant, I am determined to. So seeking God with your, with your whole heart was like wanting to always, in all you could, with your own will, with your determination, to seek God and to live in God's ways. So it's more like your will, your determination. But I, I will always have to get reminded of that still, again and again and again. It's, it's really, really hard for us to separate it from the emotional, emotion sense. Emotions for the Old Testament were more here. Your belly. Your belly was more the seat of your, what they thought was your emotions. So we think our knowledge and our choices, right? And our emotions, I'm not sure what we think about our stomachs. <laughs> that, that's just like something makes your stomach turn over or something, like, like shocks you or something maybe. But, but anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so, so it's, it's also, again, so to love God with your heart is, making, is also making a choice in the, in the sense of the um, Old Testament. But I think also loving God with our whole heart, meaning our whole Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength is saying your whole person. You know, actually, that's the whole thing, you know, to love God with your whole person. We need to get on to, I think we're going to just touch real a little bit on um, Corinthians. Corinthians doesn't exactly talk about the law so much like the other Bible passages, but there are a little few points about it that I think, I don't know. I find it there are some interesting things, so we'll just touch on it. But um, I know Bruce. Do you feel? Would you want to read today? Sure. Okay. Where are we? We're on the First Corinthians. It's probably on the. 
I'm assuming it's on, on the front page where it says 1 Corinthians. For, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the light. <laughs> You're welcome. All righty. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, and, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I led you with milk and solid food, for you were not ready. No, that was wrong. Yeah, not that solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are not, uh, let's see, you, jealousy and quarreling among you are not of the flesh, and uh, behaving according to human limitations, uh, you know. Inclinations. Limitations. Yeah. For when one says, you belong to Paul, and another one says, I belong to Apollos. Are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants to whom you came to believe that are the Lord assigned to each I planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who, uh, let's see, waters is anything but only God gives growth. The, the one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose. And each one shall receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, we working together. You are God's, uh, uh, I can't read Field. That. Field. Field. Uh, building. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, um, so I appreciate well, that. You know, it was good. Yeah. Learning how to read it, you have three top. You did very well. You did very well. So, um, so Paul's been, you know, trying to set them on a better path that they've gotten into this um, divisions and like, who do they follow? Do they follow Apollos? Do they follow Paul? Even some said they belong to Christ, which sounds odd because like, well, don't we all belong to Christ? But they had made these factions and they were arguing like who's, who's, whose group is better and stuff. So Paul is just trying to say, oh, you're so confused. And he makes a point that I'm not sure it might have sounded offensive, I would think, to the, to the community because he he's kind of says he's calling them you babies. You know, he says... You're acting like a bunch of babies, is kind of what he says. But but he, he does it in a more, actually he does it kind of in, in a way of making an appeal. He, he's saying, when I was first with you, which which by the way, the timing and the, they believe of when this was written, is they believe Paul was there like probably four years before when he had come and he had first preached the gospel and he had first, you know, been there with their community and everything so helped evangelize to them so probably they believe like four years sooner earlier and you know he says and then i i had to I had to you know feed you baby food you know you were so young you were so new in the faith and you just didn't know things you didn't understand and part of me smiles a little bit because in the imagery as paul is painting it you know paul is saying like i was i was your baby nurse I was your 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 nursery caregiver. I was your, and I was feeding your you feel go 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 bite take a bite. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like like I mean I just I smile a little bit trying to picture Paul as he he it's a metaphor he's using, but just picturing him being like that is kind of to me a little funny. But but it's it's you know he was saying I tried to give you what I knew you could receive at that time. You were so new in the faith. You were very young in the faith. But I think the reason he's um, trying to he's trying to kind of say, you know, you've been at this four years. I mean, it doesn't say that literally, but we, if we know that it's four years have gone by, he's like, you could tell he's like he's expecting a little more maturity by now. You know, like he would have hoped they would have been, you know, grown up in their faith at least some by now. Um, so that's why he's now kind of. Um, scolding them, you know, well, you know, if you had been growing in your faith, as I would have thought, you would know better than to be quarreling 
and and in jealousy of each other and making these you know difficult things and splitting into factions and then he goes on though to big, bring them back together again though because he says you know there's yeah there's different people who came and ministered to you but god's the one only god is the one who really makes it happen who really brings faith and brings the growth we're just the workers any of us and that's any of us we're just the workers god is the only one who could really uh, bring faith and help grow faith you know i think it's and i'm just contemplating mm -hmm. this I, I can also see in uh, in my own life mm -hmm. uh, i mean literally i'm not saying i wasn't necessarily a follower but if i could if there was a uh, pastor or whatever who made a connection mm -hmm. to me that I could understand and cause me to grow. Mm -hmm. I tended to favor that pastor mm -hmm. over another pastor who I may have gone to and I, I didn't, didn't quite I help you in the way get, that wasn't was quite helpful. Yeah. Stuff. But the, mm -hmm. but this uh, this other pastor somehow managed to Yeah, I think me and bring me along and for my yeah. needs. Yeah. And uh, so I can say uh, worshiping that pastor isn't the right thing. No. But it, but it's like uh, some teachers uh, in school, there were some that you just made a connection with and mm -hmm. you just loved and you learned and you went and there's others you would, oh, man. Can I, I make it through this I class? Was, yeah, this terrible. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's just normal human. I mean, we're all uniquely made and, you know, some is, you know, people who are educators know there's people who are more here, you know, listen auditory learners, some are more visual learners, some are more experiential learners, you know, so we all absorb in different ways, you know, so yeah, it makes sense that we're gonna, but the problem, the difficulty is trying to set up as if, but we're in different groups. And Paul's just trying so hard to help remind the people is, you know, we really are together. We really are only one. And I like, I like the reminder, we are God, you are God's field, you are God's building. Like even our own day and age, you know, um, even, you know, there's Catholics and there's there's um, Methodists and there's Baptists and there's Lutherans and there's, you know, it's like, but we are, we are all God's field. We are all God's building. And once, you know, um, I think it's not so much as it was in the past because it used to be like if you were one denomination, you don't dare marry someone in another denomination it was even as bad in lutheranism as you know if you're this kind of lutheran you don't dare even marry that kind of lutheran you know so so um the reminder that we are you know for god god is working in all of us and that that's god's work and that's that's a good thing well we need to get into matthew and uh, boy i say we got some interesting stuff jesus tells us some interesting stuff in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 5. <clears throat> All right, so we are still in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. This is a Jesus' very big and very pivotal and very important message. Uh, sometimes there's, um, again, a way of looking upon Jesus as he's being doing a lot of Moses-type type things, um, he goes up on the mountain. Moses went up on a mountain. Oh, well, if you look back in Jesus' early days, you know, Moses was threatened by a powerful leader, but he was rescued. Jesus was uh, threatened by King Herod, but he was taken to be safe. You know, you can, you can make certain correlations. And, and so Moses went up to the mountain, and he received the Ten Commandments and brought them to the people. And now Jesus uh, takes some time to speak about the Ten Commandments, give... Um, He's acting like a rabbi would, a teach, a, a Jewish teacher would. He is giving some, um, you might say, interpretation of, of scripture of of what you know we now know or call the Ten Commandments. Uh, he doesn't talk about every single one of them, uh, but he does jump into one of the biggies, <laughs> I would say. Oh, actually, also important to remember that the the verse right before this. Uh, let me see. Find my place again. So just before, uh, a little bit before, 
in this same passage in in chapter five. Let's see, it was a verse. I'll, I'll just read verse uh, seventeen and eighteen. So just a little before this, in chapter five, Jesus said, "Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill." For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So even as Jesus is giving his own interpretation of God's law, um, we should never ever get some kind of notion that Jesus wanted to do away with the law. I feel like, if anything, he goes in deeper. <laughs> he takes us deeper. So, um, So let's pick up. Uh, let's see. We're going we're gonna to break this up for sure because there are quite a few verses. So let's first do from um, from Matthew five and do verse. I'd like to do verse twenty one through twenty six. Um, do, do you want to? Are you? Yeah, twenty one through twenty six. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Under the law of Moses. The rule was, if you murder, you must die. But I have added to that rule and tell you that if you are only angry, even in your own home, you are in danger of judgment. If you call your friend an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you cure, curse him, you are in danger of the fires of hell. How far did you want? Uh, keep going through I'm verse sorry. 26. That's, thank thank you. you. So if you are standing before the altar in the temple, offering a sacrifice to God, and suddenly remember that a friend has something against you, leave your sacrifice there beside the altar and go and apologize. And he reconciled and, and be reconciled to him. And then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Come to terms quickly with your enemy before it is too late. And he drags you into the court and you are thrown into a debtor's cell. For you will stand there until you have paid the last penny. The law of Moses said, okay. I'm no, sorry. you can, one more is okay. Yeah, okay. do that one. The laws of Moses said. Oh, I'm sorry. No, maybe we're stopped there. Yeah, till the last penny. You're right. You're right. You got it. You're right. That last penny was the last part. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. To the last penny. Okay. Um, so so Jesus is um, commenting on, you know, probably one of the maybe best known of, of the Ten Commandments, you shall not. Now, we were having a little discussion uh, before, right before Bible study. Uh, sometimes you hear it, the word, word dead, that commandment worded as you shall not kill. But this is more um, what Jesus states, you shall not murder, is more really like what the, word, the wording is. But still sometimes we will see versions of it that will just say you shall not kill. But really it's more like you shall not murder, which is you know plot and intentionally to carry out an intentional taking of someone's life. Um, and there, there is a distinction between law and order and you know, sometimes nations uh, may uh, need to, not that we should ever endorse war, we would always hope all war would go away, but there is a distinction between when you are fighting on behalf of your country um, versus a just, I personally decide to take away your life, you know, something something along those lines. Yeah. And I think even when you're talking about uh, Moses going into, you know, going into the promised land, they then, they and they did fight. They, they did. Didn't have to kill. They sometimes were fighting and sometimes killing. killing. So hopefully you, not murdering. But yeah, yeah. So it's it's an interesting. Um, anyway, there's lots of nuances, and it's not wrong for people to always want to cherish human life on every level. I mean, there's there's still valid perspective for that. But but let's just um, let's just kind of take it as Jesus is is using it in the moment. And so he does use the wording, you shall not murder, uh, and then, but whoever murders shall be judged, you know. But then he says, well, there's more to it than that. And I always, uh, you know, because if we just stay at that level, I think, thankfully, the vast, vast, vast majority of people 
are like, I, yeah, I've never murdered anyone. And so I could say, I have kept that commandment. Only Jesus goes more, more deep. He goes more intensely. And he says, well, if you've ever been angry, actually, if you've ever been angry, actually, you have actually still broken the commandment. I think whatever might break, that, yeah. That, that's the point I've been trying to, I was waiting to make for a long time. Yeah. You think of rules yeah. as go kill, this is the way you, what, what you should eat. But but even in the Ten Commandments themselves, most of them are not talking about actions. They're talking about relationships. Mm -hmm. Number one, your relationship with God, mm -hmm. your relationship with your parents. And then the one that causes many non-believers and non-Christians the most are the ones that sometimes get translated as covet. Mm -hmm. It's not saying that, you know, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't have the desire, that you, you shouldn't be jealous. Many of these laws and rules are talking about dealing with what your actual emotions and relationships are, especially with other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, those, are, and, and, and Jesus comes along and, and sometimes simplifies it love your neighbor as yourself mm -hmm. but that's right there in the ten commandments if, if you look uh, about what it's talking about mm -hmm. and, and this is hard because you know it says even if you don't take action on it god is reminding us you might still be you know is there a jealousy there so a lot of these rules are really um maybe it's also jesus yeah and, and it's about relationships and maybe jesus lifts out these are things that are already the seeds that might lead to the the worst outcome, maybe too. That just even even these seeds planted in our life, maybe maybe the things that step towards. I mean, you know, why people end up murdering someone because they're in a you know they are so angry with someone that they decide that 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 person deserves to die. Or you know, I mean, I, th I think even having anger in itself is already already damaging. Just anger. But I think, too, I could also see that potentially some of these could be a path toward the worst outcome. Yeah. I don't know. That's, and agreeing with Johnny, uh, yeah. uh, using your analogy, <clears throat> when I see something, am I jealous? If I, I, I ask myself mm -hmm. a question, is it because of jealousy? Why am I angry? Why, you know, mm -hmm. if uh, you, I'm not supposed to be doing that, but mm -hmm. I, I think it, it causes me, my Christian upbringing causes me to question, well, why do I feel that way? Mm -hmm. And I like also the reminder that so much of this is about our human relationship, our connection with one another. And that, um, and what I appreciate then, while Jesus points out more, even more clearly how we already start to break in our human relationship, these are broke, brokenness in our human relationship, he starts to at least uh, give us a guidance about well, how can we try to um, improve or bring healing? Because that he talks next about if you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. Be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come with come and offer your gifts. And even the come to terms quickly with your accuser. It's it seems like Jesus is trying to lift up. Um, about us trying to reconcile, about trying to make peace. Uh, is, what is the phrase, do you want to be right or do you want to have a relationship? Like sometimes kids get a, such a big squabble and, and sometimes older, us adult people could be reminded like, okay, do you want the justification like, I am right. Or do you want to have a relationship? And so sometimes maybe a willingness to be open to be like, you know what, my relationship with this person is more important than me proving superiority over them. Maybe. I'm not saying it's not, I don't want to say it's wrong to stand up for something that's right. I don't want to be like, all of this is like, there's a lot of nuance. You can't just like, you know, make a blanket Overall, this is the what you always have to do. But I, I just really like the going for peace. The encouragement is it's not only refrain from the anger, but is can we can we make peace? You know, yeah. 
uh, four or five years ago, you might remember, we were studying the Psalms, and I was a substitute teacher for Zoner then, and I came across what Martin Luther mm -hmm. said about the Psalms, and it would be fine with him if you only had to have one book. Martin Luther really, really liked the Psalms. He says, and there's no rules in Psalms. It's, it's all about uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. I've heard it expressed about the psalm is that the psalm, you can find every kind of human expression almost, every human life situation almost. If you go through the psalms, you know, like it, it contains the, the whole of our human, a lot of our human existence is in there and stuff. So, so, so anyway, I appreciate that. And I also, um, I was uh, reminded in, it was, I was reminded that, okay, yeah, Jesus doesn't just say don't do this. Or makes more of what we should be on guard for, but he also says to go for peace, go for reconciliation, and um, so he points us to not only what not to do, but what to do. And Martin Luther, when he does his own um, talking about the Ten Commandments, he does very much the same thing. He kind of expands more about well, what does that really mean when it says to honor your father and your mother? You know, he talks about how do we do that. But then he talks about things like, he extends it, he says, and that means also honor, honoring authority. He sees a, a correlation, honoring those who have authority in your life, uh, to kind of being, you know, respectful of authority, I guess you could say. That's kind of a extension. So he tends to see something, and then like things like do not steal, it's, it's more than just don't take away from your neighbor, but how do you even help your neighbor uh, to help protect them from from somebody else stealing from them. How do you you know help them from losing their possessions to somebody else even? So so I like that uh, just like Jesus is doing, uh, Luther uh, pretty much did that with the commandments also, especially related to the people and everything. Yeah. So uh, so let's go to the next uh, portion. And this the, so the first one was you shall not murder. That was that commandment. The next one is. Um, more towards the you shall not commit adultery, uh, that, that commandment. And so let's see, that's in chapter 5, and that's verses 27 through 30. Um, Betty, would you have that? And you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. And the right eye causes you to sit, oh, tear it out, and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Did you say the 30? Uh, yes, 30, please. And if oh, you're right. 30? Yeah, and if, you're right. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Yeah, okay. So every now and then Jesus speaks it away, or you're like, okay, wow, Jesus. You know, it, it doesn't, it's not as the, um, you know, blessed are those who, and then bring the children to me. I mean, this is like, wow, this is strong. And this, I mean, that's a very intense way he's expressing it. Now, we have to understand that that's a, that is a style of speech. And it and it is it's a way of um, speaking to an exaggerated level to get your attention to get your point across. So you know it's not a quite and thankfully not literal. Although I'm afraid maybe at times it might have possibly been taken literally. But you know Jesus is being exaggerated to make a point, as in this is very serious. You know the and and the seriousness of. It is, I'm, when I think of the, you shall not commit adultery, that's, you know, you've made, and it kind of comes up in the next few verses, you've made an oath, you've made a commitment, you've made a promise. And breaking such a promise, that's a betrayal. And when I think of, you know, murdering is about as bad a thing as I can think of a human can do to another human, but I feel like betrayal is also really to me, at least in my way of thinking, way up there as one of the worst things a human can do to another, to another person is, is betrayal. And um, 
And so I think to me, that's part of where, you know, Jesus comes on very, very forcefully. Um, another angle of it, another element of it is that it's, it's, um, it's like turning a human into an object. I think that's another element. Instead of seeing a person as another human being created in the image of God, worthy of all respect, and just turning them into an object. I think that's another element of the what's what's being done there and why that's also wrong. Um, we're, I realize we're kind of getting short on time, so I don't want to, um, you know, but again, it, it gets back to that thing of what is the best life and the best way we should treat one another as human beings. And, you know, and Jesus is really trying to get us back to that, to really see that again. Um, we will fail, we will fall, but it's also, it's always God's best intention for us to live in the best way possible as human beings. But then when we do fail, and sometimes this also helps us see that we do fail, it makes us realize that and admit that, is then we can, we can rely on Jesus and what Jesus has done for us and knowing that we are redeemed and that we can always, always say, okay, God, help me do it, do this better. You know, I'm not doing, trying to do this better so I can earn salvation. I know that's a gift that's already given to me. But because I already know that I belong to you, I, I desire to care for one another in the way you would, you would want me to. So to keep looking for that help from, from God to do that. So we'll, um, we didn't get quite through all the verses, but we'll go ahead and uh, yeah, we'll finish there. And we do, I think, have some more of the Matthew passage next week. So we'll, we'll kind of be doing some more of that too. Oh, wow, we did a lot. So let's, uh, thank you so much. Let's join in our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may you have a very blessed week.